Hi, welcome to uh, the listening of the story Ghost Boys. This is the text that we're going to be reading to start school. I'm going to be recording myself reading the story to you and we'll be answering some questions uh, together along the way on the video. I thought it would be nicer for me to read this story to you in a video because you'll be able to re-listen to the video as many times as you need to understand the story. I'm actually not sure why I wasn't doing this all along. So it looks like our new situation with hybrid learning is actually going to make me do a better job uh, teaching you. So the name of the story that we're going to be reading is Ghost Boys. Here's the cover. And it's written by Jewel Parker Rhodes. And today we're going to listen to page 1 through 31. And before I start reading, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the story, get you prepped for it. The main character in the story, his name is Jerome Rogers, and he also has a family that consists of his grandma, his ma and pop, and his little sister Kim. There are also a crew of bullies in the story, and their names are Eddie, Snap, and Mike. And I read it like that because they're almost like one person in the story. They're always together. They're always up to the same thing. Always trying to bully Jerome. Okay. Um, the setting of this story is Chicago, which is a city in Illinois. And um, it's a very popular city. You might have heard about it in the news. Um, Chicago is where Oprah Winfrey comes from. So when we're in class together, we'll look at some maps and do a little bit uh, more work around what the setting of Chicago looks like. What you need to know about Jerome is that he lives in a very, very poor neighborhood, a very dangerous neighborhood, and most of the time he fears for his safety uh, walking to and from school. And then he also fears for his safety being in school because Eddie, Snap, and Mike are always picking on him and bullying him in school. So let's get going. Here is Ghost Boys. This book is dedicated to the belief that we can all do better, be better, live better, we owe our best to each child and every child. You might be wondering why the book opens up and it says the word dead. That's because in this story, our main character, Jerome, is dead. And we start the story off by learning how he is dead. This is Jerome talking. It's coming from his point of view. How small I look, laid out flat, my stomach touching ground, my right knee bent, and my brand new Nikes stained with blood. I stoop and stare at my face, my right cheek flattened on concrete. My eyes are wide open. My mouth, too. I'm dead. I thought I was bigger. Tough. But I'm just a bit of nothing. My arms are outstretched like I was trying to fly like Superman. I would barely turned, sprinting. Pow! Pow! Two bullets. Legs gave way. I fell flat hard. I hit snowy ground. Ma's running. She's wailing. My boy, my boy. A policeman holds her back. Another policeman is standing over me murmuring, it's a kid. It's a kid. Ma's struggling. She gasps like she can't breathe. 
She falls to her knees and screams. I can't bear the sound. Sirens wail. Other cops are coming. Did someone call an ambulance? I'm still dead. Alone. On the field. The policeman closest to me is rubbing his head. In his hand, his gun dangles. The other policeman is watching. Ma like she's going to hurt someone. Then he shouts, Stay back! People are edging closer, snapping pictures, taking video with their phones. Stay back! The policeman's hand covers his holster. More people come. Some shout. I hear my name. Jerome! It's Jerome! Still, everyone stays back. Some curse. Some cry. Doesn't seem fair. Nobody ever paid any attention. I skated by, kept my head low. Now I'm famous. Chicago Tribune. That's an article in a newspaper called the Chicago Tribune. The headline reads, Jerome Rogers, 12, shot at abandoned Green Street lot. Officer says he had a gun. Now the book switches and it says alive. That's because this story goes from Jerome being a ghost and being dead and then learning about Jerome's life when he was alive. So now we're going to go to a point in the story back in time before Jerome is shot and it's how he started his day. It's December 8th morning. Come straight home. You hear me, Jerome? Come straight home. I will. I always do. Ma leans down, hugs me. Grandma slides another sack of pancakes on my plate. Promise? Promise. Same ritual every day. I stuff a pancake into my mouth. Kim sticks out her tongue. I'm a good kid. Wish I wasn't. I've got troubles, but I don't get in trouble. Big difference. I'm pudgy. Easily teased. But when I'm a grown-up, everybody's going to be my friend. I might even be president like Obama. Kim says she believes me. That's why I put up with her. She can be annoying asking too many questions. Like, what makes a cloud? Why are their shapes different? Telling me Minecraft is stupid. Begging me to help pick out a library book. Hurry up, else you'll be late, says Grandma. She hands Ma a lunch sack. At school... Me and Kim get free lunch. Everybody works in our house. Ma is a receptionist at the Holiday Inn. Hang on, I need a sip. Ooh. <clears throat> I'll start that part over. Hurry up, else you'll be late, Grandma says. She hands Ma a lunch sack. At school, me and Kim get free lunch. Everybody works in our house. Ma is a receptionist at Holiday Inn. Her shift starts at 8 a.m. Me and Kim's job, says Ma, is going to school. I tell that to my kids, too, that that's their job is being in school. I think that should be all of your job, too. Pop leaves the house at 4 a.m. He's a sanitation officer. He drives a truck. In the old days... There was a driver and two men hanging off the truck's sides, leaping down to lift and dump smelly trash cans. Now a steel arm picks up bins. Pop does the whole route by himself. He stays in the air-conditioned cab, steering, pressing the button for the mechanical arm, and listening to Motown. The Temptations, Smokey Robinson, 
the Supremes, 60s pop music, Wayne, hip-hop is better. Grandma keeps house. She cooks, cleans, makes it so me and Kim aren't home alone. Have snacks, homework help, although I prefer playing video games. After school is troublesome, says Ma, pushing back my chair. I kiss her. Come straight home, Ma repeats, tucking in her white uniform shirt. Grandma hugs, squeezes me like I'm a balloon. She pecks my cheek. I'm worried about you. Been having bad dreams. Don't worry. That's my other job, comforting Ma and Grandma. Grandma worries the most. She has dreams. Premonitions, she calls them. Worries about bad things happening. But I don't know what, where, when, or why. Sometimes I dream lightning strikes or earthquakes. Sometimes it's dark clouds mushrooming in the sky. I wake troubled. Remembering her words, I worry. I know Ma will remind her to take her blood pressure pill. Pop worries too, but he usually doesn't say so. Early morning, before he leaves for work, he always stops by my room. Kim's too. He opens the door. There's a shaft of hallway light. I've gotten used to it. Eyes closed. I pretend to be asleep. Pop looks and looks then softly closes the door and goes to work. Jerome, Grandma clasps my shoulder. Tell me three good things. I pause. Grandma is truly upset. Upset. Half moon shadows rim her eyes. Three, Jerome, please. Three, Grandma's special number. Three means all, optimism, joy, Grandma says every day, heaven, earth, water. Three means you're close to the angels. I lick my lip. One, school is fun. Hold up two fingers. I like when it snows. Then, three, when I'm grown up, I'm going to have a cat. A dog, too, but I don't say that. A dog would be four good things. Can't ruin the magical number three. Grandma exhales. <sighs> I've said exactly what she needed to hear. Fine. I've told her. I'm fine. I stuff my books into my bag. I wink. I wave bye to Mom. Study hard, she says, both smiling and frowning. She's happy I comforted Grandma, but unhappy with Grandma's southern ways. Ma wants me and Kim to be educated. She pokes her finger at us when she says you. Ed, you, poke, cated, Jerome. Sometimes the poke hurts a bit, but I get it. Grandma dropped out of elementary school to care for her younger sisters. Ma and Pa finished high school. Me and Kim are supposed to go to college. Kim is by the front door, backpack slung over her shoulder. Kim's nice, but I don't tell her that. She's bony, all elbows and knees. When she's a teenager, I'll be grown up. Everybody will worry more about her than me. Ma always says, in this neighborhood, getting a child to adulthood is perilous. I look up the word perilous, risky, dangerous. I pull Kim's braid. Frowning, she swats my hand. Can't be good all the time. Later, I take my allowance and buy Kim a book. Something scary, fun. We walk to school. Not too fast like we're running. Not too slow like we're daring someone to stop us. Our walk has got to be just right. Green Street isn't peaceful. 
It isn't green either. Just brick houses, some lived in, some abandoned. Out of work men play cards on the street, drinking beer from cans tucked in paper bags. Eight blocks to travel between home and school. On the fifth block from our house is Green Acres. A meth lab exploded there, two houses burnt. Neighbors tried to clear the debris, make a basketball court. It's pathetic. A hoop without a net. Spray-painted lines, planks of wood hammered into sad bleachers. At least somebody tried. Two blocks from school, drug dealers slip powder or pill packets to customers, stuffing cash into their pockets. Pop says, not enough jobs, but it's still wrong. Drugs kill. Me and Kim cross the street, away from the dealers. They're not the worst, though. School bullies are the worst. Bullies never leave you alone. Most days, I try to stay near adults. Lunchtime, I hide in the locker room, the supply closet, or the bathroom. Kim slips her hand in mine. She knows. I'll meet you after school, I say. You always do, she squeezes my palm. You going to have a good day? Yeah, I say trying to smile, searching the sidewalks for Eddie, Snap, and Mike. They like to dump my backpack, push me, pull my arms, pull my pants down, hit me upside of the head. Kim clenches her hand, purses her lips. She's smart for a third grader. She knows surviving the school day is not easy for me. She never tells. Ma, Pop, and Grandma have enough to worry about. They know Kim's popular, and I'm not. But they don't need to know that I'm being bullied. Kimmy! A girl shouts. Kim flashes me a grin. I nod. Then she skips up the school steps, her braids bouncing. As she and Keisha chatter, giggle, crossing left into the elementary school. Middle school is to the right. Yo, Jerome! I look over my shoulder, hugging my backpack closer. Mike's grinning. Eddie and Snap, fists clenched, thug posing, stand by his side. Damn, have to be super careful. During lunch, I'll hide in the bathroom. Maybe they'll forget about me and find another target. I can hope. Just like I hope I'll win the lottery. A million dollars. So that was him going on his way to school. And now the story is switching back to after Jerome has been shot. And now he's dead. And he's a ghost. Right now, if you're reading along, which I hope, I'm on page 21. Ghost. The apartment is packed. Ma's sisters, Uncle Manny, my cousins, Reverend Thornton. The kitchen table is covered with food. My favorites, potato salad, lemon meringue pie, pork chops. If everyone wasn't so sad-faced, I'd swear it was a party. I reach for a cornbread square and my hand passes right through it. Weird, but it's okay. I'm not hungry. I guess I'll never be hungry again. I move, circling the table. People don't pass through me. It's like they sense I'm taking up space. Even though they can't see me, they shift, they lean away. I'm glad about that. It's enough being dead without having folks enter and leaving me like ghostbusters. 
Ma is in my bedroom, lying on my bed with the orange basketball sheets. A poster of Stephen Curry shooting a ball is taped on the wall. Ma's eyes are swollen. Grandma holds her hand like she's a little girl. I don't feel much, like I'm air touching the furniture or Ma's hand. Maybe that's what happens when you're dead. But seeing Ma crying makes me want to crush, slam something into the ground. Inside me hurts. Outside me feels nothing. I try to touch her. Nothing. Just like the cornbread. Ma shivers. It makes me sad that I can't comfort her. I turn toward the doorway. Kim is reading a book. She does that when gunshots are fired outside. When our upstairs neighbor, Mr. and Mrs. Lynn, are, f are fighting, yelling. For now, I know she's okay. Reading makes her feel better. I stand in the doorway, shocked how my room is filled with family, how it isn't my room anymore, isn't my place where I imagine, dreamed of playing college ball, or in the army, diving out of airplanes, or rapping on the radio, or being president. To my right, Pop leans into the corner like he wants to collapse into the space and disappear. His eyes are closed and his arms are folded across his chest. Who will he shoot hoops with or eat hot dogs with while cheering the Chicago Bears? I'm here, I'm here, I rasp. Ma on my bed, curls on her side, Pop's lips tighten. Grandma looks up, searching. I'm still here, Grandma. Her face is a wrinkled mess. I didn't realize it before, but Grandma is really old. She looks up and through me. Her eyes glimmer. She nods. Does she see? Does she see me? Reverend Thornton moves past me. He doesn't realize He's tucking his stomach in and entering the room sideways. Grandma notices. Everybody else thinks it's strange. We should pray, he says. For what? asks Pop. Jerome's not coming back. Ma gasps, sits up. James, we don't know God's will. It's man's will. It's a policeman acting a fool, murdering my boy. Pom, Pop's fist slams the wall. The drywall cracks. I've never seen Pop violent. He's in a better place, says Reverend. Jerome's in a better place. Am I? Ma rocks, her arms crossed over her stomach. Every goodbye ain't gone, says Grandma. Mom, hush with that nonsense, complains Ma. Every black person in the South knows it's true. Dead, living, no matter. Both worlds are close. Spirits aren't gone. Superstition, scoffs Reverend. This is Chicago. Jerome's soul is already gone. I kneel. I'm here, Ma. I'm still here. We'll bury him tomorrow, cries Ma. I want to cry too, though my eyes won't make tears anymore. Sue, I'm going to sue, says Pop. No sense why my boy's dead and those white men are walking around alive, free. Emmett. Just like Emmett Till, says Grandma. He was a Chicago boy, too. This isn't 1955, says Reverend, calming. Tamir Rice, then, Pop shouts. 2014. He died in Cleveland. Another boy, shot just because he's black. Grandma looks at the space where I'm standing. Her head is 
cocked sideways. She's breathing soft. No justice, no peace, says Pop. Since slavery, white men been killing blacks. Then he starts to cry. Ma hugs him, and they hold tight to each other, like they're both going to drown. My heart shatters. Nothing hurt this much, not even the bullets searing my back. My alarm clock clicks, 12 a.m. Nine hours ago, I was playing in Green Acres. Now, it's a new day. I'm here, but not here. Where's my body? Where do they keep it? until it's laid in the ground. Time to wake up. I spin around. Who said that? I leave the bedroom, wandering through the apartment, past eating, crying, praying, searching for who spoke to me. In the kitchen, by the window, I see a brown boy like me. His eyes are black velvet. He's tall as me. His hair, short like mine. He stares and stares as if the world has made him so sorry, so sad. Scared, I step backward. He nods like he expects it, then disappears. He's not in the kitchen. My hands pass through the glass pane. I see the starry sky, the darkening road. Street lamps attracting bugs. Across the street, I see him. Wispy, like soft rain. A ghost, like me. Now we're on page 27. And I'm wondering how you're feeling right now for Jerome and for his family. And imagining what that must feel like for a mom and for a dad and a grandma and a sister to have to deal with their son, brother, grandson dying when he's just 12 years old. Think about what that must feel like for them. Now we're going to go to the church. This is the church ceremony for Jerome. It's on page 27. It's awful. Spending days in the apartment. Everybody angry and mourning. Awful not being able to lie on my bed or eat or speak. I can't sleep. No rest for the dead. I watch my family crying, talking in whispers. Ma seems like she's sleepwalking, shuffling about the apartment like she's still looking for me. Pop is always shouting into the phone, talking to lawyers, newspaper folks. I can't think of anything worse than watching my family hurt. At night, the living room fills with shadows, misshapen, ugly things. I don't go into my bedroom. Too sad. Ma sleeps there now. Kim, whose bed is the couch, whimpers while she dreams, afraid to sleep. Grandma stares at the ceiling. Pop, tangled in sheets, sleeps on his back. Both arms crossed over his eyes. No one rests well. Is there some place I'm supposed to go? I hope it's heaven, a good place, but I'm still here, which is nowhere, not able to help anybody. Grandma hums gospel, and whenever I move, she seems to know. She looks at me, standing near the television. She turns when I follow Ma into the kitchen. She leans forward, humming louder when I sit on the chair beside Pop. If she could really see me, I'd be alive, and she'd be telling me to clean my room, take out the trash, wash my hands. I miss her ordering me to do chores or saying, homework, no TV. Today, Ma, Pa, and Kim, and Grandma dress for church. It's my funeral. 
I sit with them in a black Cadillac. It's the nicest car I've ever been in. An open casket, murmurs Ma. I want the whole world to see what they did to my boy. Isn't that what Mrs. Till said, isn't it? Grandma gets out of the car first. Then Kim, Ma, Pop, then me. Grandma whispers into the air. Time to get going, boy. Time to move on. I'm stunned hearing Grandma speak to me. But I can't move. I don't know how or where to move on to. How am I supposed to know how to be dead? I follow them up the steps. Kim reaches for Pop to pick her up. He does, and she buries her face in his neck. Senor Rogers, sir, sir, it's Carlos, my new friend, old friend now. Pop doesn't hear him. He's busy comforting Kim, but Grandma does. She waves Carlos to her. Wiping tears, he hands her a piece of paper. Grandma looks at it. She presses the paper to her heart. Then she hugs Carlos, a big, stomach-crushing hug, the kind she used to give me when she was happiest. The thick church doors open. Organ music swells. Amazing Grace, Grandma's favorite. Carlos runs down the steps. He's still wearing a hoodie. Never mind the cold and snow. Deacons and church ladies in white dresses swarm about my family, fanning them, guiding them from the vestibule into the church. I start to follow. Suddenly, my ghost friend is beside me. Don't go in there. You don't want to see. Who are you? Someone I wish you didn't know. I stare. His skin is paper thin, dull. His shoulders are broad. His cheekbones high. His clothes are funny, old timey. He's wearing a white shirt with a tie. He holds a rimmed hat. I'm you. Nothing makes sense. I reach out to touch him. Maybe ghosts can touch ghosts. He disappears. I sit on the church steps. Stay outside. Maybe it's better this way. Not seeing myself in a casket. I try to imagine what Carlos wanted to give Pop. What Grandma saw. What would just for a second, make Grandma happy at my funeral. That's the amount of reading we're going to do for this video. And I want to add a name right here in the middle. Carlos. Carlos is going to be an important character in the story Ghost Boys. I'd like you to think about what Jerome's family is going through right now and what Jerome is going through. And who do you think the other ghost boy is? Do you have any idea who that might be? I think some of you might. We studied this person last year when we read um, the story March. So you might know who he is. Um, it, it, it is a male ghost. I will give that much away. It's a ghost boy. Maybe that's not giving too much away. So let's review. We're reading the story Ghost Boys. It's by Jewel Parker Rhodes. The setting of this story is Chicago, a city called Chicago, and we're in um, Jerome Rogers' neighborhood. We see parts of his uh, family, Grandma, Ma and Pop, and his young sister, Kim. 
We're introduced to Eddie, Snap, and Mike, who are the bullies, looking at him, going like this right before he comes into school. And at the very end of the story, we learn about a really important character named Carlos, who hands Jerome's grandma a note that she clutches to her chest. And for one minute, Jerome can tell she looks very happy. And he's asking himself, what could it be that Carlos has given my grandma at my funeral? All right. Well, what you can do now is go into Google Classroom. You can look at your Quizlet, which is going to have all the new vocabulary that you might be hearing in ghost stories. And you can also go into Google Classroom and complete the questions with um, short answer responses, uh, talking about um, the ideas and things that we're starting to learn about Ghost Boys, uh, pages 1 through 31. Um, thank you. I hope you like the story, and we'll be seeing each other in class soon.